trained as a physicist, but I've been working on medical research for the last 10 or 15 years, really, ever since I became a graduate student. Um, and it's really the medical questions that have, have really driven the work that we've done and, uh, and allowed me to apply my knowledge of physics to, to try to solve some of these uh, difficult questions. So today my talk is going to focus on the work that we've done in Alzheimer's disease. And we work at the Robarts Research Institute, uh, as Catherine mentioned. Uh, we have a lab there. It's a very sophisticated imaging lab. Uh, and the Robarts, just to give you a bit of background, you've probably had speakers here in the past from Robarts. But the Robarts is a very unique place. It's not set up as a typical university department, like a chemistry department or a physics department. But it was really designed as a multidisciplinary uh, environment where people from different disciplines could get together and try to solve difficult, difficult medical, medical problems. So we have physicists working beside biologists, working beside people who are experts in statistics, engineers, a very broad range of expertise. And we all come together to work on specific problems. What I'm showing here is one of my favorite pictures of the brain which we have acquired. Now this is really blown up. Uh, and this is a, a, an MRI image of a brain that was acquired at very high field strength. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about this particular image later in the talk. But I like this picture so much, I'd like to put this on my wall at home. And I show it every chance I get. So what I wanna talk about today is a little bit of an introduction to Alzheimer's disease. I'm gonna give you some statistics and some of the issues that we face, the challenges that we face. But really, my talk will focus on the imaging developments that we're working on to try to get a better handle on when the disease starts, how the disease progresses, and to try to figure out how to treat it better. So to start with, Alzheimer's disease, I'm sure, has affected probably everyone in this room in some way or another. You probably know someone that has had Alzheimer's disease, or maybe a relative. Um, it's a very, it's a disease that starts with a very slow onset. Usually people notice uh, memory problems to start with. But then soon after that, you begin to have problems with language, with visual and spatial function, with motor planning, and with executive function. And the disease usually runs its course within five to 10 years and ends in death. It is a terminal disease. Its cause, we don't know exactly, but one of the hallmark indicators of Alzheimer's is the abnormal deposit of proteins in the brain, or protein fragments. We call these amyloid, amyloid is one of them, and tau. You know, I won't talk about them too much in the talk, but I will mention them a bit later on. And we normally think about the progression of the disease as going through several stages. So people are aging normally to start with, and then they go through a phase that we call mild cognitive impairment. So this is where you start to think your, your memory is going a little, it's not really, not really sure. But then people, not all people that, that have these symptoms go on to get Alzheimer's, but some of them will eventually progress to have Alzheimer's disease where we actually can document changes in these functions that I've described. And then Alzheimer's itself has several stages, a mild stage, a moderate stage, and a severe. 500,000, this is the number of people today in Canada that suffer from dementia. Alzheimer's is the number one cause of dementia. So it's a huge number of people that are already affected. That number is expected to increase to over a million people within the next 25 years. So it's really a, a looming crisis in healthcare. 400 million hours. These are the number of unpaid hours that family members spend caring for people with Alzheimer's disease. And the cost is over $33 billion annually, and that's direct health care costs and lost productivity. So really a massive, massive problem. The diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease is usually made <coughs> taking a patient history, looking at memory, looking at how people's activities of daily living have changed, looking at indicators of cognitive performance. And the last point here, that there are no established biomarkers, is the most important point on this slide. There's no blood test that we can give to tell you that you have Alzheimer's disease. There's no imaging test at the moment that we can say definitively that you 
have also <coughs> disease. And that's really the part of the, part of the puzzle that we're working on. We're trying to develop new biomarkers that will help us diagnose it earlier and speed up treatment. What I've got on this slide is a picture on your left of what a normal brain would look like for an elderly uh, person, someone probably in their mid-70s. On the right-hand side is what the brain of a patient with Alzheimer's disease looks like. You'll notice some very distinct features which are different between these two brains. So on the right, the brain is a little bit shriveled, there are spaces inside the brain which are very large, cavities that are filled with fluid, and the tissue around the edges is, is much less than the tissue in the normal brain. This is because the brain tissue is actually dying away in the disease. So as the disease progresses, the neurons in the brain are deteriorating and dying. And this is why early treatment is so important, because once a cell, a brain cell, a neuron dies, there's no way to recover it. We can't regrow brain cells. So we have to intervene early in order to save function in the brain. There are four treatments which are approved for Alzheimer's disease in Canada. I'm just going to mention them quickly. There are three that are cholinesterase inhibitors. I'm not going to describe what that means, just going to mention what they, that, that, that they exist. And there's also one that's, in, that's called an NMDA receptor antagonist. So there's four treatments. Unfortunately, these treatments are symptomatic, what we call symptomatic treatments. So these uh, treat the symptoms of the disease. They boost cognitive performance for a short period of time, usually on the order of about a year, a year and a half. But they don't slow down or stop the progression of the disease itself. Why has it been so hard to find cures for Alzheimer's? Well, first of all, it's a very, very complicated disease. We don't actually know what the cause of Alzheimer's is. There are theories around uh, these different proteins that aggregate in the brain that I mentioned earlier. Amyloid, amyloid plaques that form, uh, the formation of tangles. But we really don't know what the causative event of Alzheimer's disease is. Diagnosis happens very late in the disease. By the time a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease is made, there's been significant damage in the brain already. Because the brain is actually very, very good at compensating for changes. And as I mentioned earlier, biomarkers don't exist. If we had a blood test that could predict when someone would get Alzheimer's, it would be much, much easier to develop a good treatment. So what is a biomarker? What makes a good biomarker? Well, a biomarker is simply an objective measurement that we can use to predict when something is going to happen related to disease. An example of this is blood pressure. We all know what blood pressure is. It's a number. If your blood pressure is high, your doctor will probably prescribe something to lower it because we know that blood pressure, elevated blood pressure, is a risk factor for cardiac disease and for stroke. We use it for diagnosis and we use it for drug development. We, we test the drug for blood pressure, we can check whether or not it reduces the blood pressure, so we know that it's being controlled. We don't have a biomarker like that for Alzheimer's disease. So what I'm going to show you now is a little bit more focused on the work that I do, which is the imaging of the brain related to Alzheimer's. And what I'm going to do is just very quickly show you some examples of the kinds of imaging that's available now that gives us information about the brain. The first example that I have is an MRI image of a patient that was first diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. So this is a, a section of the brain taken with an MRI scanner. If you imagine just cutting the head down this way and, and taking off the front part and looking in, this is what you would see. So we call this a coronal section through the brain. And what I've circled in red there are what we call the ventricles. These are fluid-filled uh, regions of the brain. And around it, the white part is the brain tissue. And what, you, what you'll notice in a minute is that as the disease progresses, what, what this, person, uh, this person came back for a second scan one year later, and I'm going to bring that image up in a minute, but I want you just to focus on 
Well, we've got fluid space in the middle of the red circle to see how it changes over one year. So I'm going to bring up the second image now and look at the expansion of that space. Right? So I'm going to bring back the first image, bring back the second image again. Look at how much that brain has changed in just a single year. That's because brain tissue is dying of disease, and those fluid spaces are increasing. We could also measure glucose metabolism. So this is uh, not as nice a looking image, but this is an image that was acquired with a PET scan. PET doesn't have the same resolution that MRI has, but it's a very, very sensitive technique. So we can measure how the brain, how, how the metabolism of the brain is using PET. So here's an example of a person at the top that uh, came in at age 53 for a PET scan. They had a fairly normal MMSE score of 27. That's a score of, of uh, cognitive function. And then five years later, their PET scan is at the bottom. Uh, and you can see some very dramatic changes. Their cognitive score had declined to 13 out of 30 from 27 out of 30. And you can see very significant drops of metabolism in this person's brain. We can also measure function with a technique called functional MRI. I'm not going to talk about this very much, I just wanted to mention it. We can actually see what parts of the brain are involved in doing specific tasks. So we can look at the part of the brain that's involved in making memories. And we can see whether or not it's functioning properly using this technique. And we can track how a person's memory function changes over time. There's a number of different techniques that we can look at or use to look at blood flow. So here's one example. This is a SPECT scan of blood flow. Uh, again, we know that blood flow changes after disease. This next one is called magnetic resonance spectroscopy. And I'm going to spend quite a bit of time today talking about this. It's something that we do a lot of in our lab. So this is a method where we use an MRI scanner not to acquire anatomical images of the brain that I just showed, but to acquire chemical information. So each of the peaks that you see in this, what we call a spectrum, represents a different chemical or a metabolite that we can track over time. We can measure things like glutamate, which is a neurotransmitter, different amino acids, measure choline and creatine. There's about 19 different metabolites that we can measure. And each of them gives us an indication of what's happening in the brain. This one here is called uh, amyloid imaging. So this is one of the most exciting developments in, in Alzheimer imaging in the last 10 years. This is a PET technique that allows us to image one of the proteins or protein fragments that's increased in the brain in Alzheimer's disease. So amyloid is the name of that protein fragment. With PET, using specific compounds that we inject into the body, we can label those amyloid fragments, and we can see how they're elevated in Alzheimer's disease. So in this case, we have a control image on the left, which looks dark blue. That's normal levels of amyloid. And then on the right is a patient with Alzheimer's disease, so you can see much, much higher levels of amyloid present. Amyloid is a, is a very interesting uh, marker, and a potentially very valuable biomarker in Alzheimer's and it's something that's being studied very heavily here and also around the world. And finally, and I'm going to mention a little bit more on this later in the talk, um, we, are, we are developing very targeted contrast agents using uh, different techniques, optical imaging, PET, and MRI, that target different uh, cellular processes that are changed in all sorts we think using these kinds of targeted approaches, we'll be able to capture the very earliest changes in the disease. And I'm going to show you a little bit of data from that later on. So first of all, what does MRI measure? MRI is a very safe technology, which is why I have the cartoon on the right. Uh, it's something that, it's a technology that uses exclusively magnetic fields. There's no radiation involved whatsoever. We do have some safety issues that we worry about with MRI in terms of heating people up, uh, but we're very careful not to heat people too much. And we're very careful to make sure that anyone that has an MRI scan doesn't have any metal in their body, which is magnetic. Because if you do, then you wouldn't, uh, there's a potential for that to cause injury. But MRI is a very safe technology, and it essentially measures water. 
the signals from hydrogen nuclei from water molecules in your body. And we can use those water signals to make images like what you see on the left. So these are anatomical images with very high resolution, very nice detail, good contrast, and we can modulate that contrast based on a number of different things. Here at Robarts, or at Western, we are very fortunate in that we have access to some of the most state-of-the-art MRI equipment in the world. We have, at Robarts alone, four MRI scanners, which are research-grade scanners. They're not used for clinical work, they're used for research. Three of them are found within what we call the Center for Functional and Metabolic Mapping. So this is a center that focuses on high-field MRI research. We have Canada's only seven Tesla human MRI scanner. And I'm going to describe what Tesla means in a minute, but it's a very high field strength. We have a three Tesla human MRI scanner, and we have a 9.4 Tesla, which is really high field uh, MRI scanner, which is dedicated to small animal imaging. So we do mice and rats, and that's the system. And we can look at mouse and rat models. So this is a very active center. It supports over 100 different faculty projects at any given time. And we have a dedicated staff that's there to assist people with research studies. Field strength is very important in MR research because as field strength increases, we gain signal. And by gaining signal, that gives us the ability to either image faster or image with higher resolution. And we also get different contrasts. So are, there are many things that you can see in a high field image that you can't see in a low field image. So this image on the left, the, the image that you see on the left is an image that's acquired on a low field clinical scanner. The image that I showed uh, earlier in the talk and, and I'm repeating here is an image that was acquired on our 7T scanner. It's higher resolution, it's about 500 micron isotropic, so that means in every direction resolution, which is very high resolution. Um, and you can see the contrast is very good. You can see differences in what we call gray matter, white matter, and CSF, and you can see detail that's just simply not present in the lower field strength image. Going to higher field strength also allows us to do things like MR spectroscopy, which is more difficult than low field, and to do even fancier things like imaging pH in the tissue, which I'm not going to talk about today. But it, it, it really provides us a wealth of information that uh, we have access to in the brain. So what I want to focus on for the next few minutes is some work that we've done just in very simple structural measurements in the brain. So what I want to, want to describe is um, the ventricular system. So this is a system of, it's a space in the brain, which is essentially filled with fluid, which we call cerebral spinal fluid. And you can see it, uh, this, the image on the right that, uh, that I had up earlier, you can see the ventricles as uh, sort of dark areas uh, right here that I had circled before. And you can see them in this, in this rotating skull as, as red, these red structures. So these are fluid-filled cavities that really extend throughout a large part of the brain. They go all the way from the frontal cortex through the parietal and temporal lobes. And part of it this, this horn, this temporal horn here, is actually adjacent to a part of the brain called the hippocampus, which is one of the very first structures in the brain that's affected by Alzheimer's disease. And as that part of the brain begins to shrink and die away, we see this part of the ventricle increase in size. So what we did is we developed, and this is going back a few years now, but we developed a way to measure ventricle volume very precisely. We thought we might use that to track the progression of Alzheimer's disease. So here's an image, an MRI image, uh, sagittal cut now through the head, and you can see the, the volume or the ventricle outlined in red here. And what we do is we use, we acquire a series of images of the brain, we, we measure where the ventricle is, and then we reconstruct a 3D model of that ventricle. And we can use that model to track disease progression. And right around the time we were doing this, there was some really exciting uh, work that was happening. Um, a big study that had started up in the United States called the Alzheimer's Disease Neuroimaging Initiative. 
This is a massive, massive study. It was about an $80 million investment by the National Institutes of Health in the US and industry. Industry funded about $20 million of this project. It was initially a six-year multi-center study that involved uh, about 60 sites in the US and Canada. London actually participated with two sites here. Um, and their mandate was to recruit 200 normal elderly subjects, 400 subjects with co mild cognitive impairment, and 200 subjects with Alzheimer's disease. And then to follow those people over time, taking MRI scans every six months, and look at how the brain changes over time. So we had access to that data. And what we did is we, we compared how the ventricles behave in the different groups. So this is a graph on your left that shows ventricle volume for the different groups. So normals is shown in green, people with mild cognitive impairment in yellow, and people with Alzheimer's disease in red. And you'll, so, you'll notice that there is a significant difference in the ventricle volume between these different groups. But you'll also notice I have these error bars on the plots, and these error bars are very large. So that gives you the sort of range, the normal range within that group. So there's a lot of overlap between these different groups, and so it's really not a good biomarker, because if someone comes in, and we measure their ventricle volume, it's difficult to tell exactly which group they fall into. We started to look at ventricle volume change. How does the ventricle change over time? So this is change over six months. And we compared people that were normal to people with mild cognitive impairment to people with Alzheimer's disease. And this, is, this data really uh, surprised me in some ways. So the average age of this group was about 75 years. What we found was that people that were aging normally, their ventricles actually changed. They expanded by about half a cubic centimeter in six months, which I thought was really extraordinary. I hadn't expected to see any change in people that were aging more. People with mild cognitive impairment, their ventricles were expanding even faster, 1.5 cubic or 1.6 cubic centimeters. And people with Alzheimer's disease, even faster, 2.6. So we're beginning to be able to discriminate between the two groups. And then we did an, a sub-analysis, and this is uh, not very much data, but it supports the idea that we can potentially use this to predict who might go on to get Alzheimer's. What we did is we compared, we looked at just the people with mild cognitive impairment, and we compared people that were stable over time to people that went on to get Alzheimer's, that progressed to Alzheimer's. And what we found was that the people that were stable had a different rate of expansion than the people that went on to get Alzheimer's. So that means that we could potentially, in this group of people, measure how quickly their ventricles are expanding and be able to predict whether or not, based on that expansion rate, <coughs> you would eventually go on to get Alzheimer's or not. We've also gone on to do other work looking at measuring other structures in the brain, like the hippocampus directly. <laughs> and there are many other different techniques that we can use uh, to look at other structures in the brain. Other groups around the world are doing this as well. So the advantages of MRI, as the cartoon suggests, is that we don't have to do anything invasive. We don't have to remove someone's brain to take a measurement. We can do it completely non-invasively. We can measure things like ventricle volume. We can track changes over time. We can measure other brain structures. I haven't shown you that data, but we can do it. Um, so this could be a potentially valuable biomarker. So someone could come in get a scan or get repeated scans, and we could actually track how the brain is changing over time. The next part of this talk is about a technique that I mentioned earlier called MR spectroscopy. So this is another technique that we can use to look at changes in the brain. But now we're not talking about structure. We're talking about metabolism. So we're not looking at how the size of things change we're looking at function. And what I've shown here on the right is a spectrum for one of the metabolites that we can measure called n aspartate So this is a really interesting metabolite to me because it is found only in neurons in the brain. So in any condition where you have neurodegeneration, where you have neurons dying away, we see levels of this metabolite dropping over time. So this could include things like Alzheimer's or Parkinson's or other neurodegenerative 
So using the MRI scanner, we can acquire spectra from specific parts of the brain. And that a spectrum looks typically like what you see here at the bottom. It has many different peaks in it, and also has a lot of noise. So it's difficult to pull out what the different components are. But we've come up with ways of uh, measuring these different components. And I'll show you that in a minute. What we typically do when a person comes in for an MR scan is uh, we're looking at a part of the brain here called the hippocampus. So this is a part of the brain that's involved very early on in the disease process. What we do is we plan a series of slices that are parallel to that structure. So that looks like this. And then on the right hand side is one of those images that's going right through the center of that hippocampus. And I've outlined the hippocampus here in yellow so you can see what it looks like. It's kind of shaped like a banana. What we do then is we can place a volume, or we call it a voxel, directly inside that and measure a spectrum. And this is what we would get as a spectrum like what I'm showing here at the top. What we do is we model each of the different components of that spectrum. So each metabolite has a signature, a unique signature, which is captured down here at the bottom. So the top line, the blue line, represents the signature for N-acetylaspartate. But there are signatures for things like glutamate, glutamine, creatine, choline, myonositol, a whole range of other different metabolites. And we, what we do is we use these models to reconstruct the in vivo spectrum and then we can work out what the concentration is of each of those different metabolites. So we measure things like NAA, which is a marker of neuronal viability and function. We measure things like choline, which tells us about membranes. We measure creatine, which tells us about energy metabolism. Glutamate is a really interesting metabolite because it is a neurotransmitter. And myonositol is sugar. So here's an example of what it looks like. So this is the, uh, an older MRI scanner that we had at the Robarts uh, about 10 years ago. This is a four Tesla system that was used for many of the studies that I'm gonna show. This is an image through the hippocampus. You can see the box from where we're making our measurement in green. And then this is the data that we would get. And here is a fairly busy slide that really summarizes about 10 years of work on a single slide. Um, and what this is showing is the changes that we've detected in various metabolites, um, either as a function of the disease or as a result of treatment. And so I'm just going to mention a, a couple highlights here. And one is that this marker, n aspartate which is found in neurons, we know that it decreases in Alzheimer's disease compared to controls. So we know that this metabolite level is declining over time. These are two of the treatments that I mentioned earlier. One of them called denepazil, one of them called galantamine. When a person is taking denepazil, which is probably the most common treatment for Alzheimer's in Canada, levels of this metabolite do not respond, so they continue to decline, which tells me, tells us, that neurons are still dying despite being put on this medication. When we put people on a medication called galantamine, we were not able to detect a change in NAA. That could be viewed as positive, but it's difficult to say. Glutamate, the primary neurotransmitter, excitatory neurotransmitter in the brain, also decreases in Alzheimer's disease. We were one of the first people to show this. <clears throat> Putting people on denepazil doesn't change or causes no change in glutamate. Putting people on galantamine actually increases the amount of glutamate in the brain. So it looks like it's having a positive effect. It's reversing the decrease that we detect, which I think is very positive. But still, these changes are only temporary. Remember that these drugs only last for a short period of time. They don't really modulate the disease. Uh, and so what we really need are better treatments that can slow down or stop disease progression. So just to summarize this portion, <laughs> we know that treatments change metabolite levels. We know that metabolite levels are different in Alzheimer's disease compared to normal controls. MRI
our spectroscopy is therefore also a potentially valuable biomarker. So we want to use techniques like spectroscopy, like imaging, to evaluate better treatments, new treatments, potentially eating better and getting exercise are maybe as good as the treatments that we have now. So what about the future? So in our lab, we have very high field MR equipment. We are continuously striving to move to higher field strength as a, as a research community. It gives us huge advantages. Uh, we can acquire, as I mentioned, very high resolution, uh, high sensitivity images very quickly at high field. We can also get better metabolic data. Here's an example of an even higher field strength study. So this is an example of a study that we did in collaboration with Dr. Stephen Pasternak, who is also a scientist at Robarts and happens to be a neurologist as well, who specializes in Alzheimer's disease. The question we had was, could we actually detect the amyloid plaques in the brain using MRI? So this is a cartoon that shows these amyloid deposits that are sort of characteristic of the disease. They form in the brain at the end stages of the disease. What we did was we took our highest field strength magnet, the 9.4 Tesla MRI. We can't use this for humans, but we can look at animals and we can look at specimens. And what we did is we looked at an excised piece of a human brain from a patient that had Alzheimer's disease. And using a scan on that 9.4 Tesla, uh, which I've shown here, we are actually able to visualize the amyloid plaques. So here, what you're seeing here, this white is actually the, the what we call the gray matter. So the contrast is kind of reversed in this image. This is the gray matter of the brain. And these little dark flecks or dots that you can hopefully see are the amyloid plaques. So a normal brain would have none of this kind of speckled feature. This is the hippocampus where the disease starts. You can see this massive space, ventricle space beside it. You can also see the amyloid plaque down here. So MRI is able to detect the plaque, just not in humans while they're alive. It's not going to be a valuable biomarker <laughs> for developing new diseases. This is a plot of kind of a summary of the biomarkers that we have available. So this is a um, uh, kind of a proposal that was, was put forward by Clifford Jack, who is one of the leading neurologists studying Alzheimer's disease in the world. This was published in 2010. And what he did is he looked at all the different biomarkers that, are, that were being developed at the time and kind of tried to stack them up in terms of when do they start, when do we see changes. So you can see the biomarker magnitude on the, on the y-axis and changes in cognition on the x-axis. So the first thing that changes is you get this upregulation of the proteins or peptides in the brain, but we can't detect those. Then you start to get neuronal injury, which is the blue curve. Then you start to see changes, subtle changes in brain structure. And we can start to see those still when people are very normal cognitively. And then we see it when people are in the mild cognitive impairment stage, and then when they're, when they're in the dementia stage. And then following that, shortly following that, is when you get memory impairment, and then loss of clinical function. Our glutamate measurement, I would put on the curve here. So this is slightly ahead of brain structure change. So it's, it's going to give us an advantage in terms of sensitivity. But it's not where we really want to be. We want to be back here in this area. We want to move this curve right back to the beginning to detect it at the earliest stages. So one of the things that we've been developing, and this is where being at the Robarts is such a huge advantage because we have interdisciplinary teams that we can form to tackle problems like this, is we are developing novel, con what we call contrast agents, that will target specific pathological changes in the brain. So a contrast agent is something that you inject into the body, and it basically hones in on a specific region that's abnormal, and shows up as bright in the image. So here on the left-hand side is, is an image without a contrast agent, 
This is in a tumor patient, by the way. This is not Alzheimer's disease. But just gives you an example of how this works. And then this is the contrast image. And you can see the signal enhancement that's caused by the contrast agent. This is what we need for Alzheimer's. So what we've done in collaboration, again, with Dr. Stephen Pasternak and uh, Professor Robert Hudson here at Western in the chemistry department is to begin to design novel probes, novel agents, that we will target to specific changes that happen in the brain at the very earliest stages of the disease. So the way we build these things is in three sections. So I've given a schematic of it here. We have on, on your very right a contrast agent part, which is the part that we detect with the MRI scanner or the PET scanner or whatever imaging system we have to use. We have a targeting section in the middle in blue, and we have at the far left what we call a cell penetrating peptide or section. This is the part that gets this entire molecule out of the blood and into the brain. Our target for the time being is something called the Pepsin D. So I'm not going to go into details about what this is, uh, but I want to mention uh, just a couple of key things. So first of all, it's found within cells in a specific compartment called the lysosome. And its function is to break apart proteins. So we think that when amyloid and other abnormal proteins are starting to accumulate in the brain in Alzheimer's disease, levels of this protein, or protease it's called, begin to increase to break it down. We know that pathepsin D is increased in people that are at risk for Alzheimer's disease. We know that there's increased levels of this in cerebral spinal fluid. So we think it's a good marker for early detection. What we've done is we've built an agent that targets this molecule. So there's an MRI tag on it on the right. We've also added an optical tag, that green circle that you see. There is the cathepsin D cleavage site, which is what targets the molecule, and there's the cell penetrating. The way this works is um, we inject it into the blood, in a normally aging individual that doesn't have high levels of cathepsin D, what would happen is this agent would cross into the brain, which is on the right-hand side, and then simply diffuse out again. So that would look like this. So it would be injected, it would cross into the brain, and it would come straight back out again. In someone with Alzheimer's disease, it would cross into the brain, and then cathepsin D would snip it. And the part that is able to allow the molecule to cross in and out would diffuse out of the brain, but the imaging tag or the label would stay in the brain, and then we'd be able to detect it. That's the theory. That was the idea. So we started doing some cell experiments, and again, this was done in Dr. Pasternak's lab at Robarts. And this is some, some cell data. I'm not going to go into the details of this as well, but I just want to point out a couple of things top row that you see, so, so now we're looking at two cells, highly magnified cells. Uh, this is in a model of Alzheimer's, you could say. So these cells have high levels of cathepsin D in them. And in these cells, when we incubate these with our agent, the agent gets into the cell and sticks them. That's what these red dots and green dots are showing us. In cells that don't have elevated levels of cathepsin D, this agent doesn't stay, so it looks black. So in theory, our idea of targeting, getting the agent into the cell and having it stick, works. We've now gone on to try this in mouse models of Alzheimer's. So there's many, many different mouse models of Alzheimer's disease. Um, we've decided to use one uh, that's a very aggressive model. It has, um, well, I won't go into the details of it, but it's it, it essentially, over the course of about three or four months, develops very, very severe Alzheimer's disease. And what we've done is we've tested, or we've compared, the uptake of our agent in these mouse models, this mouse model, compared to normal ones. So what we see is that, so I, I want you to, just to focus on the red curve and the blue curve. So the blue curve is the normal mouse, the red curve is the Alzheimer's. So what's happening here is after we inject our agent 
the agent is actually staying significantly longer in the brain in the mice that have Alzheimer's disease. So again, this is more evidence that our agent is working. We're, we've made this into a pet agent, and if it looks good and works on animals, then hopefully in the next few years we'll be able to, to push this into humans. So just as I, as I wrap up uh, the talk this morning, I just want to mention a couple of things. I want to emphasize again how lucky we are here in London to have access to some of the most uh, cutting edge technology as far as imaging equipment goes in the world. And just recently, our center, the Center for Functional Magnetic Metabolic Mapping, has undergone uh, a massive upgrade, a $6 million investment, to upgrade our systems to an even higher level. So our, both our three Tesla, Tesla system, uh, which is shown on the left, and our seven Tesla system, just within the last six months, have been upgraded and, uh, and are really showing some, some absolutely fantastic results. So again, my favorite brain image <laughs> to wrap up the talk. Just a couple of points to leave you with and to think about. Um, at the beginning, I, I gave you some statistics and went over a little bit about the disease. Alzheimer's disease really is a looming crisis in healthcare. There's going to be a huge expansion or increase in the number of people that are affected by the disease. Uh, not just the people with the disease, but their caregivers and families. Um, the disease causes many changes in the brain. And by the time a diagnosis of Alzheimer's has occurred, using current methods, the brain has already changed significantly. And so we are working on developing ways to detect the disease earlier using MRI, using structural measurements, using metabolic measurements, and using targeted agents, which hopefully will someday be useful in the future. So I'm going to end with just thanking um, a number of people. This is not all work that I've done, but we have a huge lab of people uh, that are involved in different aspects of this, which includes many graduate students, many postdocs, many scientists, physicians, so all of them have had a hand in, in, uh, in the data that I presented today, and a lot of data that I haven't been able to present. Um, so I want to thank you again for your attention, and I'm going to leave you with this final. <laughs> <laughs>